hi hello good morning good evening good afternoon from depending on where you are logging in uh, to this webinar uh, we are in tricrum webinar series 21 with uh, pavani today welcome once again pavani good morning i know it's very early for you uh, thank you for joining us today i have kiran uh, absolutely i have kiran with me today very who glad would, to be here who is a product manager and who would have the conversation mainly with the pavani around this topic of ethical product development this is brought to you by product owner studio in collaboration with price scrum studios a little bit on the technical setup for some of you who are very new to zoom webinars you don't have an option to speak uh, and uh, but you can always use the chat to communicate with the panelists and the hosts and uh, you always feel free to raise put your questions in the q and a tab we will answer them in the end uh, so make make sure that they are put only in the q and a tab little bit of introduction about price scrum for some of us uh, who are joining for the first time in our webinar series price scrum is a management consulting firm with a mission to humanize organizations it is a ptn with scrum.org ic agile member organization management 3.0 and scrum alliance affiliation uh, we do run couple of studios or meetups uh, scrum master studio to focus on uh, the first scrum masters product owner studio to give more information to the aspiring product owners or already experienced product owners and agile leadership studio to focus on the the need of the hour which is the right type of leadership mindset for the organizations to thrive in this digital disruptions so i would give it to kiran to take it forward from here thanks venkat so uh, once again i welcome everyone to this webcast on ethical product development and to start with uh, thanks pavani for accepting to uh, be with us today and talk about ethical product development so uh, for many of you uh, who might not have uh, known much about pavani earlier um uh, she is the author of ethical product development uh, practical techniques to apply across the product development life cycle this is a short and uh, sweet book to understand about ethical product development she has uh, worked in product development uh, you know uh, in uh, the last couple of decades and uh, prior to uh, working in the product development space in product management and uh, user experience she studied economics at uh, brown university and uh, business on the uh, law at the university of virginia currently she leads the product management and uh, the user experience design teams at eab and uh, in her spare time she has written this book called ethical product development uh, more of uh, which we are going to talk about uh, shortly and uh, i'm happy that uh, she has uh, chosen to join us in our discussion today and uh, she can help us understand how the product owners can consider themselves as ethics owners uh, we'll start with a few introductory questions then uh, we will uh, request pavani to take us through the case study that she has prepared for us today and uh, we'll also have a q and a uh, based on how the time permits so once again uh, welcome pavani thank you so much for having me today and thanks everyone for joining All right, so let's get started. I can go ahead and share my screen. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Uh, while we are at it, uh, curious to understand uh, uh, why yeah we wrote this book, Pavni. So could you throw some light on that? Yes. Um, so I um, first of all, you know, the first thing I want to say is, and I think many of you are joining this webinar because. technology and its role in society have never been under more scrutiny. So if you look at really the mainstream news these days with uh social media with looking at the large companies the ethics of Google and Facebook and um other large companies um as well as 
uh, artificial intelligence, facial recognition. There's a lot of hot topics in the news today. Um, and so I wrote this book on ethical product development because as many of you, I'm in the practice of uh, product management um, and user experience design and have been working in this area for the last 20 years. But I, and I'm constantly reading about um, how to do different aspects of these uh, practices better, but I've noticed a gap specifically the gap around really bringing ethical decision-making into the process in a regular, um, you know, ritualized way. Um, and we have all sorts of processes in our field, um, you know, whether it's, you know, the agile ceremonies, whether it's, you know, how to do a design brainstorm, how to document requirements. Um, there's all sorts of processes, but then when it comes to ethics, there really isn't um, you know, a whole lot of practical guidance. And so because I couldn't find what I was looking for, I decided to put together and write what I was looking for and try to use it for myself and with my own team um, as, as a practical guide and, and then also decided to publish it and share it. Awesome. Uh, thanks for that insight. And uh... So um, today in the world, we talk about how the product owners or the product managers can create habit forming products, right? We do not typically talk about the ethical products or, uh, you know, uh, the questions that the kind of questions that uh, the product owners or the product managers encounter. So could you give some examples of the types of these ethical questions? Yeah, I, I mean, and absolutely. I think you touched on it, Karen, a little bit with we were thinking about habit forming products um, and services. And there's so many examples of questions that have an e very ethical dimensions even related to that. And so one of the um, types of questions was how do you use uh, in an individual's personal information um, to nudge them to take certain actions, right? It's, you know, to create those habits. What are the ethics around using people's data to nudge them? Um, you know, should we feed people's data into machine learning tools? And, and you know, what does that look like? How, you know, how do we make sure that the algorithm is fair? Um, whether and how we should gather consent when we use uh, individuals' data. So, of course, there's some, you know, just some very minimal regulations that we need to follow, but there's a whole set of ethical considerations on how to, how to really gather their um, input and their consent in, and when we use their data. And I'm sure your, um, you know, our, our group here probably has a, a number of other um, aspects. Um, there's one I noticed in the chat. What are your thoughts on um, ethical product development when it comes to um, a commitment, a shortfall um, in a commitment to supply goods or commodities? Um, can, I, I'm wondering if this panel, if this uh, attendee can explain the question a little bit more. Um, who will be charged with their shortfall and commitment to supply goods or commodities? Like it, it, the question is if you, if you don't have enough, if you don't have enough um, or if the price is too high, um, is, that the, is that the question? Mm, probably. Um, I'll give some time. Yeah, the, probably the attendee could uh, throw more light onto the question and uh, add uh, an extension of his question into the chat window. But uh, let's continue. And once we have that, we can uh, discuss about it. Absolutely. Sure. Uh, uh, so uh, thanks for this uh, great book that you have uh, provided uh, that gives insight on ethical product development. Uh, but given your earlier experience and research while uh, writing this book, how would you define an ethical product? Yeah, so um, really, you know, ethics is, um, is, is pretty hard to define because what I may think is ethical, um, you may not and vice versa. But so my definition for an ethical product is one that at the very minimum, it strives to avoid avoidable harm. So it's the product of a process that specifically embraces ethical decision-making every step of the way and starting with a set of principles. And so um, what I'm, and I'm gonna be sharing those with, with you all further today, but really it's a more, it's a, it's a, um, 
uh, an ethical product is really one that is born of a process that actually takes these considerations into mind. And there's several other descriptions that, um, that people are using these days to talk about the ethics of technology development. And so, and I like all of those. So there's people call, they call it responsible uh, product development or inclusive product development or accessible product development. And actually accessibility kind of falls into, um, you know, one of the attendees questions, which is how do you make sure that your goods or services are available to, uh, the, to the largest group possible? Um, so accessible, um, people also talk about um, mindful product development or even morally imaginative. So if you can imagine a future state that is better than the current state, then that's like a, a morally imaginative uh, product development process. I like the word ethical and the, the discipline of ethics because um, you know, central to my um, theory here is that there really should be a deliberate decision-making process based on a set of principles. And that is really fundamentally the field of ethics. Like how do you apply principles um, to everyday types of decisions? Okay, yeah, that certainly makes sense. Uh, so uh, is this targeted at specific groups of people uh, or uh, I mean, in other words, who's your uh, intended audience? Yeah, so my audience for the book um, includes all of the roles that are involved in the product development process. So that could start from like the founder and entrepreneur um, to, of course, product managers, product owners, um, user experience designers, and then and then folks who are developing the software, so software engineers, data scientists. Um, you know, QA, uh, quality assurance uh, specialists, um, and then even beyond that. So those who are involved with delivering and customer success, so customer support and even product marketing and sales, um, to really think through all of the uh, elements of the whole uh, process and where ethics can be introduced and, and evaluated. Um, so today I know, Karen, that my audience is the role of the product owner who works very closely with engineering um, to produce the solution. And, and really that role is, I, the way that I see this role is that it's the bridge between what the team wants to build and how we're actually building it. So I think it's also a very, very central role in, in ethical decision-making. And I wanted to introduce um, that there's a new-ish ter new term in the field called ethics owner. And I noticed in your, in your bio, you call yourself a problem owner, which ethics in a lot of ways is sheds light on an ethical problem. So an ethics owner is a role that a person can take on, whether it's formally or informally, that operationalizes ethics within your, within your, your team and your, and your company. Um, and I know I sent you one of the links, um, which is there's a free report on the web by a group called Data and Society that examines the challenge of the role of the ethics owner um, in how, you know, how to um, incorporate ethical decision-making into um, their day-to-day -day work. So I'd love to share that out with the group um, if folks are interested. Uh, uh, this is uh, exciting stuff. I know uh, I'm more excited about the case study that you're going to share with us uh, shortly. And uh, I'm also sure that uh, diving deep into it, we will get to know, uh, know better about ethical decision making, how we can incorporate that into the product development process. So, but before even going into that, uh, could you uh, tell us a little more about the overall framework first so that we get a pulse of uh, what we are getting here? Yeah, absolutely. So on the screen, you all can see on the right hand side, um, this is the book. It's um, called Ethical Product Development. And um, it really is a short book. It's meant to um, be kind of a desk reference. Um, it takes about you know, maybe a little less than two hours to read. And it includes 20 uh, techniques across the framework um, that you can apply in a day-to-day -day, um, sort of way. So um, I wanna share with you the way that it's organized um, so that you have a better idea of um, considering how to incorporate ethical decision-making into the day-to-day -day process of product development. 
So I organized the book into five chapters, and there are five perspectives that we have to take as product leaders. Um, and so these are the five um, imperatives one by one. And these, I think of these as things that you must do in order to incorporate ethics into the decision-making process. The first one is to build a product code of ethics as a foundation. So what is a product code of ethics? It's a handful of principles that really are your guiding light, your North star. So they're meant to be aspirational. And this is where I encourage the organization to keep them up to date. So every six months or every one year, revisit the principles to make sure that they're up to date. And we can talk more about that as we do the ethics case study, um, Kieran. And then the second imperative is really to actually use them. So this idea here is to build um, a team, an informal team, and it could be the product owners, um, where people are championing each principle so that they can bring the principle to life. Um, and so after you think about what the product code of ethics really is stating that your team and your organization to do, you have to find the right people to advocate. Um, and then the, the next um, really important activity is to identify the ethical shortcomings of your product today. So I take, so I, I really outline the process of how, how to do that. Um, and this is so that your, your product actually aligns with your product code of ethics. Um, because the reality is that uh, products and companies will be judged by their worst precedent. So they'll, they'll be judged by the, you know, kind of the, the, the most, um, you know, the most problematic part of the, of the product. And so it's important to kind of do this audit and then make sure that we're raising the floor. And then the fourth imperative, which is really the heart of the book, um, and this is where most of the techniques are, is to um, incorporate the um, ethical decision-making into every stage of the product development process. And so there can't be really a separate ethics process that's not gonna work because it's gonna be very easy to forget about it and to just push it to the side. Um, so what I do is I break down the product development uh, process into five phases that go from discovering the problem that we're trying to solve all the way to building the solution to putting it in the user's hands and then you know assessing whether it's what kind of impact it's having and then the last one is a little different while the first one have to do with um, how teams work together this last imperative imperative is for um, individuals to really stay personally committed um, to their um, own ethics and to strengthen their own muscles around ethical decision making because, you know, maintaining the stamina and the inspiration for this over a long period of time really takes, um, takes work to think about what it is that you want um, your career code of ethics to look like and how, how you're living that code. So these are the, these are kind of the five chapters and then inside of that, um, there are uh, 20 techniques and I break them down. So that's kind of an overview of the book. All right, so um, this definitely sounds exciting and I don't think we can wait more to get into the details. So uh, why don't you please uh, go ahead and describe the case study. Okay, perfect. So we want to um, build our ethical muscles as Yeah, <laughs> so this, this is good right? time for us to start we're gonna start exercising and it will feel a little like hard work, but I really um, would love for everybody who's on the call today to participate. Um, uh, you know, Venkata and Kieran um, for sure, but then also I really encourage everyone to participate in the chat. But I've prepared a case study for your group. Um, and I want us all to imagine that we are all product owners. And to some degree, I think all of us are product owners, um, and we're part of a product development team that is producing a specific solution. And I chose a solution that I think we can maybe all relate to because all of us at one point in our lives were very likely students, young students. Um, and so I'm going to go ahead and um, talk you through this case study. And um, I think that also, I know that uh, we will put in the chat, I prepared a PDF 
um, separate file for the case study in case you want to keep it up on your screen and read it, um, you know, on your on your own. Um, but we just joined a, co a, a company that is scaling this solution. Um, and so what we wanted to do at this point is really think through um, how do we avoid avoidable harms and do good things for, for society. So let me let me tell you a little bit about the details of the case study. So um, as you probably all imagine, um, I, based on my accent, uh, you can tell that I was uh, born and raised in the United States. Um, but my parents actually were born and raised in Andhra Pradesh, India. They uh, immigrated to the United States um, in the late 1960s. Um, and so I have a special connection to Andhra Pradesh. Um, you know, I, I have visited a few times. Um, uh, and so I, you know, sometimes follow um, what is happening in technology, um, you know, in South India. And so one of the things that I had um, seen was this, um, this project. Um, so as of 2017, the state of Andhra Pradesh has a gross enrollment ratio in primary schools. So that's the, um, the percentage of students who are enrolled in primary school that's nearly 15% below India's national average. And so we're now part of this team um, that is using a machine lear learning algorithm to look at a lot of different kind of data about these students. Um, so there are details about their enrollment, their, their performance, their um, demographics, their, um, the, way, the, the infrastructure of their school, their teachers' um, skills to predict whether that student, whether an individual student is likely to drop out. And so we have, through this machine learning algorithm, we have models a variety of factors um, ranging from insufficient resources to how the students performed in previous school years to influence, um, that influence how um, much a student is likely to stay or to drop out. And we've identified 20,000 students um, with a high likelihood, according to our algorithm, to, uh, to drop out. And we have assigned um, four to five teachers, students to each of the teachers. So that's about 4,000 to 5,000 teachers who are going to then intervene with the students using a mobile app. Um, and what they're going to do is they're gonna see on this mobile app the primary reasons that each student might likely drop out. And then they're going to be able to talk with the student um, as well as his or her family um, to encourage them to stay and continue their education. And so this, so far we've been piloting this and now we're all on a team and we're considering expanding the program to um, 10,000 schools across Andhra Pradesh and, and this will cover 5 million students. Um, and if this program works particularly well, um, we would want to expand it even larger, um, you know, across um, other states in India and across the country. So any, um, any questions um, so far? Uh, you know, I know we put a few, th a few of the details in the chat so you can easily refer after I move off this slide. Um, what we're gonna do next is actually the case study, which is now that we're preparing to scale this solution, how are we going to think about avoiding avoidable harm? And how are we thinking about how to maximize um, positive social impact of this of this whole effort. So um, the next thing we're going to do, and this this is um, one of the practices from the book, the first chapter of it is to write a product code of ethics um, to guide our work. And again, the essential question is how are we going to avoid avoidable harm? How are we going to maximize social impact? And so I've prepared this framework of eight questions that we're going to ask ourselves really from you know, the problems that we're gonna solve, who are we solving it for? What's the intended use of this? What are some, you know, what's the unintended use? Um, uh, you know, what risks are we um, encountering and what are we gonna take to prevent that, um, those risks? And then what are the um, testing protocols that we should put into place? And what is the broader impact? So what are some of the negative side effects 
of, of this, um, not only on the users, so not only on those teachers and students and families, but what about society at large um, who maybe aren't involved in this project at all? Um, and then how are we gonna uphold the principles? So this is something that we can also, um, I sent over a, a PDF of this, um, which you can have to keep, but this is a eight, ethics eight question canvas um, all on one piece of paper that shows you the questions to ask. And then what we thought we could do today is actually do this together. So we're all ethics um, owners now. Uh, so we're product owners and ethics owners. And I wanna go ahead and start to take you through each column um, and start to brainstorm what are the answers to these questions. So the very first column that I have is problems. So first question is what problems do we aim to solve with this product and for whom? And we started putting our thoughts in here just to get the ball rolling, but we, we wanted to welcome um, participants to really, you know, to ask questions and, and to participate here. Um, so this is where I would love to get some chat. So what problems do we, do we believe that we're trying to solve with this product and for whom? So again, the product is to prevent students from dropping out. Um, so school-age children should be, you know, really the beneficiaries of that. Um, we want to understand the reason for the dropout so that we can intervene. Um, government, you know, we think that the who we're doing this for is that the government has a strong desire to um, to educate uh, the population. Um, who, who else, is there any, you know, what problems are we solving and for whom? And as you've thought about this more, uh, Venkat and Karen, you feel free to participate as well. Sure. I think uh, the participants can actually put their uh, thoughts via chat. Uh, so. You have a quiet group here. <laughs> so I will keep going. Um, I'll keep going. How are we doing this in a unique way? What is unique about this, given all the, given all the types of things that you all work on? Um, what is the, what, what's unique about this? It's for a social cause and a good one. Mm -hmm. Have you have you all heard about these this type of um, effort before in terms of using machine learning or AI in this way? Okay, creating a better tomorrow for kids and family. Yep. And is there and is there anything that kind of comes to mind that feels sort of different and and new about this? Like if you know, let's say that the government and society had the same goal maybe 15 years ago, let's say that it was, you know, early 2000s. Um, what do you think is different now about, about this solution? Technology, machine learning. Yeah, and, and also like the access to um, data, the, you know, the, the, the data and the insights. Yeah, exactly. Um, that there's, that there's a lot more, um, data available, customer expectations, online learning. That's a, that, yeah, that's a, that's another one. Um, thank you for that because now we have, you know, a lot more day-to-day, -day, uh, data. So not only, you know, kind of the, demographics and sort of the enrollment type of data, but now we have behavior, a lot of behavioral data. So how should we be, and again, we're product owners, so this is, let's pretend that this is our initiative um, and we wanna be really clear and proud of this work. Um, how should we be measuring outcomes? What do you think would be a good outcome 
for this project or how would you, you know, ultimately want to measure the success of it? Students' happiness. Yeah, that's a good one. And we didn't, we, when we were practicing this, we didn't put it on the page because we, you know, yeah, number of students as part of the program, improved literacy rate. So there's a, there's a number of things. So it's not only just the enrollment, but also, you know, is this working? Is this leading to better educational outcomes for students? Um, Anything else? Would we want to measure anything about teachers? Making the problem visible. Yeah, that's a that's another great thought too. Um, so the idea of um, shining a spotlight on not only the actual metrics around enrollment or re-enrollment or dropout, but also some of the root causes or the, or, or, and it's hard to find causality, but what is correlated, what, what is likely correlated with, with the, um, you know, with the students um, dropping out. So um, mo moving along, um, uh, among the users, who is vulnerable? So we were, you know, obviously, shining a spotlight on students whose parents earn their living from daily wages, meager earnings, um, parents who may not have the information that they need. Anybody else who is vulnerable in this, in this process, in this approach? Maybe, maybe we've covered who is vulnerable. Um, students who aren't interested. That's a really good one too. Um, so how do we, so in, in terms of some of the, uh, the issues is what would we do for the students who have dropped out, right? Um, is there, you know, is, is there a way to bring them back. I can see this working, you know, if it works well, then there's an opportunity to use this um, approach to see if we can prevent the, um, you know, the, the, the dropout phenomenon. But is there a way that we can actually be even more proactive um, for students who maybe already um, have, are showing signs or, or, or not as engaged? And then I think also, um, for the students who are quote unquote aren't interested, maybe true also like what are the um, you know what's the approach that teachers should take if their interventions aren't working? Um, so maybe they have a specific way that they're intervening with the students and families. Um, how effective is that? Um, teachers, if they are not doing their job, right? Um, so you can imagine so in the case study, if um, those four to 5,000 teachers, um, you know, are assigned to these students, you know, I think it would be an important indicator of by teacher, how effective are they at bringing, you know, the students back? Um, um, yes, and parents, parents who, um, I, I, I would love for the person who just said parents to explain, how they're vulnerable. Because um, I have definitely been thinking about the about parents more, but how would you say that they're especially vulnerable? I'll let you think about that a little bit more. Let's let's go to who is powerful. Um, government, because they can make decisions to invest in this program, lift up students. Maybe the teaching community here, because they um, are they have this information now, and they can choose to take a variety of different kinds of actions to intervene with it, with the family and with the students. Um, anyone else who has a lot of power in this situation? 
parents are also powerful. Yeah. Um, because they, they would be able to, um, influence students. Uh, but also, you know, I think that they have the power of sharing information or not sharing information. I think that's another aspect of this. Who are we leaving out that we don't intend to leave out? Um, one thought that we had was the local NGO, the community. Um, and then someone picked up on this earlier on, which was the happiness of students, the students, um, it, students themselves. So it sounds like we're speaking with the parents um, and students themselves might have, you know, a lot of input. Um, so this is the heart of it. It's like, what does the intended use of our product look like? And then comparing that to what our negative use cases and uses. So the intended use is to find this pattern for, um, for students who are dropping out so that we can address those factors. Um, and if we, do, if we did that well, we would find the patterns and then we would take interventions that actually are effective in bringing the students back. Um, so can people think of what does extreme use or scaled use look like? So extreme use um, is really to pick up every bit of data that we could possibly pick up from the family, from the parents, from the student, from the community about their environment. That might be, you know, like a very, very, very comprehensive model. Um, and a scaled use would be, you know, if this program works and if it really is effective in keeping students in school, um, how do we, you know, expand that across India and, you know, around the world. Um, statistical data for psychological analysis, I'm so glad that someone went there. And also comparing that to the learning management, the, you know, the online learning and the learning analysis. So basically having a really deep snapshot about the learning um, psychology of each individual student. I would love for us to spend a little time on this to understand, what do you think? Is this a good idea? Like what would be too much, too far? What would be too much, too, too much data to collect here? Yeah, afraid of privacy. Yeah, I mean, so I've seen, um, you know, I've, I've read some research about um, taking, um, being able to sort of see and uh, monitor students' attention um, and to understand whether a student, you know, uh, and, and based on their kind of the online behavior and also their facial expressions, whether they are um, picking up the material, how happy they are in the classroom, how much they're participating, and having the algorithm make some, detect some patterns and make some judgments about that. Does anyone... Is anyone, would any, would any of you be concerned about this? Like if you yourself were being monitored in this way um, <laughs> uh, or if your children were, I, I'm just curious. I mean, there's no right or wrong answers. Absolutely, yes. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Um, yes, absolutely do it or absolutely you'd be concerned. <laughs> Too much sharing psychological tests, if any, private conversations they may have given to social workers because we're all vulnerable for targeted marketing ads. Yeah. Yeah, so you can kind of start to see, I'm illustrating how this starts to get into, you know, this overall feels like a really good thing, but, you know, where, where do we draw, start to draw some lines? Um, so going into the unintended use, which you guys went there, um, what are the negative side effects or consequences? Um, yeah, so negative side effects, maybe this data could be used for targeted marketing. Um, uh, 
it was also raised um, that political actors could use this data for election strategy to gather votes. Um, you could use the data really for the opposite purpose. Um, that's, that's possible too. Um, you could decide that these 20,000 students are not worth investing in um, and focus your attention elsewhere. Um, that's one of my biggest fears around a, a project like this is it really depends on the teacher, right? But I think a teacher who is very effectively doing his or her job would be trying to help these students and trying to overcome the difficulties. Um, and this is, it's also possible if you're a teacher that is rushing through the process to potentially make a judgment because the algorithm is helping you to make that judgment that these students are especially, um, you know, would have, would struggle to, to make it through their education. Um, and, and that would be a, a, an opposite outcome. It would be opposite to what the goal of this whole program is. Um, yes, and people are bringing up in the chat, you know, what, what's the, that data falling into the wrong hands. It, it opens up a lot of possibilities for these, this information to be commercialized. The other, the other aspect of this is the age of the children. I mean, this is creating a lifelong, or this, you know, this is a picture, you know, of, that they're at a very young age. Um, and, you know, lots of things change for people over the course of time, but you wouldn't necessarily want this historical data to be, you know, either limiting or affecting your opportunities um, you know, let's say 20 years later, 30 years later, where, you know, you don't want to have a score necessarily that um, people are making judgments about that you can't necessarily, you haven't really signed up for or can't really explain to people. Um, so there's, there's that thought. So we started to talk through, I went to the next page here, which is how will we disclose risks to our users? So teachers need to know that these are insights from a data set, but the data set may not give them enough of a picture or context. Um, so that's one thing is to explain to teachers, you know, that they may not have the full picture, that this is also, anytime you use a statistical analysis, the application of the insight to one person is always, you know, it's always suspect because that, that, that individual can, be part of the trend or they could really, because it's really a, a predictive algorithm, not a actual um, empirical algorithm. So, uh, you know, or an empirical study. So you, you don't know what the student's true outcome will be. Nobody can really predict that, but you can, um, if you take the, the prediction, you know, too seriously and at face value, you may be, um, you know, unnecessarily or um, too confident that it's, it's, it's actually predicting the outcome. Um, how will we get user input on the decisions we are making? Um, so what, what are some thoughts here? Like how can we be creative here in terms of how to get user input? A parent teachers meeting. Yeah, and really bringing exposing the algorithm bringing bringing the public into it is, is a good idea. What else? The next question is, how will we quality test our product? Not only from a standpoint of, is it working, but also from an ethical standpoint. Um, so one thought here is to interview the users to understand what questions they think are sensitive, like what data points are sensitive and which data points are, um, you know, that less sensitive and fair game. Um, and what users are really afraid of. 
and then maybe putting some some aspects of these findings um, into the product itself. That's another technique too, which is like in the app, in the mobile app for teachers, you can, you know, really design the application to um, have permissions that give it give, you know, teachers um, maybe a layer of information depending on whether they really qualify to get that information or not. Um, the next question is, um, what are the negative side effects um, on broader society? So if we take a, if we think about this without necessarily thinking about the students or the parents, what, is there anything that comes to mind that is a negative side effect of having this type of program for the broader society? Or what could be really positive about having this program for the broader society? I want to pause there because this one is is fairly important to think about because not only we don't want to think only about the just the users and the you know the teachers, the families, but Anybody else? Let me ask it in another way. Are you all glad that this program exists? Um, and no judgment. I mean, we're just just trying to understand like, is this a good is this a good program? I mean, I I definitely my personal opinion is that the more that we can know, the better as long as we use the information in an ethical way. I'm curious if, like, I think most of us are older than these children. Um, and so we probably aren't in this exact, we can, maybe we can't, we're not currently experiencing this particular type of algorithm used on us, but, um, but I'm curious, is this, what good things or what possible harms do you, do you wonder about? Public disclosure of the idea and informing people how the idea would help with, with their coming forward. Yeah, and I think, I think that that's another, it's a great point of just, I think with um, efforts like this, the more that the public can know about it, the more that you can build in some of the safeguards of is this going too far? Um, and, and also what, what are the positive things that we can we do with this? Um, so that gets me to this very last column, which is how will we help different people on our product team across the company and outside the company to uphold and evolve the principles we develop? So one, one um, best practice or one thing that a lot of companies are doing who are trying to incorporate ethics is really to be very, very transparent about what it is that they're doing to get that input, you know, to, to get some experts um, to comment. So you might want experts who are working on these kinds of um, initiatives around the world um, to be, you know, to come together and say, here's, you know, what are some of the principles that we should all uphold? Um, and then the last question is, you know, what is the current applicable legal regulation? And I actually do want to ask, socialize the benefits as well. Exactly. And I think that's a good, because that, it may sound like I don't think this is a good idea. And that's not the case. Actually, one of the, one of the aspects of the, um, of the products um, that I work on with my colleagues um, at my company um, is very similar uh, to this, this predictive uh, model. Um, and it's actually at the higher education level. Um, the, the last question is, what are the current applicable legal regulations? And I'm curious um, to just understand from the group if you all are familiar with the types of regula regulations, um, if you were to be dropped on a team that's working um, in this space, what, what regulations do you all have in India around this and in your, in your state? Yeah, I guess uh, if we can start adding that information 
Um, so this is a uh, pretty comprehensive, right? So uh, what do you think uh, is the, or rather, what would you say is the purpose of uh, sharing this case study with us today? Yeah, um, and so we, yes, and I think you're, the folks chatted the Personal Data Privacy Act, um, where the data is hosted is important. But yeah, this is, this is comprehensive. My purpose behind the case study, well, I had three goals with it. Um, the first was, um, like you said, it was exercise to give us practice in building um, these skills um, in predicting harmful consequences and actually like also focusing on the positive benefits of it in light of the harms that could be avoided. Um, and then the second was to um, really practice discussing these types of questions as a team. And it's not easy, right? I mean, I think if I were asking you a, a whole nother set of questions, maybe I would have gotten you know, a lot of chats and, um, but this is a, it's a tough, it's, it's hard to think about. It's not straightforward, simple, um, black and white. It takes a lot of, you know, reasoning of, you know, what is actually the goal? What is good about this? What could be harmful? Um, and then my third uh, purpose is really to illustrate the need for, um, you know, how to be practical about this. So we need a, we need a path forward. We're on this team. We think, or I shouldn't speak for the group, but I think overall this can be a good thing, um, but we need a path forward on how to make sure it, it, it stays a good thing and is, is, yeah. and is a really good thing versus how can it not be harmful. So that's, those yeah. were my um, goals in the, in the case study. Certainly makes sense. Uh, so uh, in uh, your book, you spoke about several practical techniques to produce these ethical products, right? So if I were to wake up tomorrow and start applying some of these techniques, so what do you think are some of them? And especially what are your favorites uh, among uh, what you proposed already? Yeah. And um, so like I said, um, this book is broken into five chapters, which are here. And I have a few of the favorite ones. Like the, the first one that we just did is I think really the starting point. Um, so having a product code of ethics, because basically what we could do if we were spending a little more time, we could say, you know, we could write down somewhere between like six and 10 principles that we really should follow when we're creating this product and when we're scaling this product. So you know, we want to make sure that we're having those uh, public uh, discourse on it. Maybe we're also really, um, you know, mindful of the regulations, but also how sensitive some of the data could be. Um, what we're, we're going to put into place um, teacher training. So maybe those are some of the principles. That's an example. Um, and so once you have the principles, then what I think another good technique is really to um, ask, ask folks to play the role of championing those principles. So as ethics owners, you could say, you know what, I'm gonna become a bit of a local expert on the data privacy aspect of this. And I will um, make sure I'm bringing that into my team meetings and into my work. So that's a way that you can kind of bring that principle to life every day. Um, the, the next one that I'd call out is the importance of really understanding, um, like doing an audit. Um, and, and now that this program, for example, um, just as an example, if you have something that's already in place uh, in terms of a product, doing an audit and talking to your users about what is, and the broader community about what is wrong, what is going wrong, or what is you know, not um, meeting the bar of the ethics that we want to have as an organization, I think that's a that's an important one. Um, I, I think the the legal one, which I bring up, is to just really try to understand um, and do some training around law and industry regulations and what do the contracts actually say, and giving a little bit of a broader understanding from the t for the team on you know what this work what what's the expectation around this work. Um, a couple other ones that I want to call out um, to are they come from Amazon, 
Um, and I think probably many of you have seen um, the idea of writing an internal press release on everything that you do. So the idea is like, it's almost like when you start a project, figure out what is the press release about it, because even that process helps you understand how you're going to explain this to the public and what questions they may have um, and what questions users might have. And so I really like that one from an ethics standpoint, because sometimes very quickly you can understand what people will um, bring up and raise as an issue. And then kind of going along with that, there's the, um, you know, writing a ethics requirements um, in, in terms of these product requirements. Um, the, the last thing, and I, I mentioned this um, in, in the course of the case study, but is to communicate with your users about product ethics in the application itself as possible. So and there could be an interface. Um, there is an app, it sounds like there's a mobile app for teachers, but there could be a mobile app for students um, or a, a place where they can see their own um, you know, data and their own information to just try to understand it. And then the part of this can, can um, help them um, either advocate for themselves or even just understand the picture that is being formed. Um, and that way they're, they're able to kind of contribute um, and, and, and influence um, the product development. So um, that's, yeah, those are my, my favorite um, techniques. Thanks for that. Uh, I really want to start acting on this uh, right now. So, but I do not know where to start. Right. So, how do you think I can get started on this within uh, my sphere of influence, or maybe in, on a broader scale as well? Yeah. Um, so, people have told me um, that one of the things that is the 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 easiest place to start is um, to have a conversation about something going on in your product, right? And so, um, and the way to have that conversation is maybe to um, think about, okay, the pro uh, think about it at, on a process level versus an issue level. So talk to, talking to each other about what is the process by which we're gonna make this decision or what, what is the process by which we are going to handle this, this ethical concern? And then, you know, um, colleagues have told me and folks have told me that this is a really easy book to read. Um, it's short and it's a, it's a way that you can talk with your and others about it um, just because, you know, it's, it's a way to, you don't have to get into the, you know, the, the depth of the ethics of it and you may have different opinions, but if you can start talking about the process, then that can get the ball rolling on how to incorporate this um, more in a day-to-day -day way. Thanks uh, really for those insights, uh, Pavni. So um, as uh, you guys might have seen, uh, so this is uh, an eight questionnaire or eight column questionnaire sort of thing that we could uh, definitely use in the world of uh, you know creating products where we want to get the users hooked. We also want to ensure that those are ethical as well, right? So this is a great start for that. Uh, I would uh, recommend that everyone reads this book and probably after reading, if you have uh, any uh, review and feedback, please provide that. Just uh, comment on Amazon. This is uh, this book is available on Amazon. I've also shared the link uh, on the ethics owners uh, report from Data and Society uh, earlier. Uh, maybe we'll share that once again. And uh, Bhavani had already shared her uh, email ID and her uh, uh, LinkedIn. She is available on LinkedIn. People can get in touch with her and uh, ask any further questions that they might have. So with that, uh, so I think we are coming towards the closure. Thanks, Bhavani, for spending time with us today and educating us on ethical product development. Thank you very much, everyone. Um, and I know that folks are eager to have dinner. Um, so, so please enjoy. And it was a pleasure to be with you today. Thank you, Pavani. Thank you all for joining. Thank you, everyone. Okay, take care. Bye-bye.